this material is ordinarily not covered in the first course on programming at the initial stages. However, I consider this notion very important because it tells you how careful you have to be while designing your algorithms and programs so that you write very efficient code or very efficient programs. We had introduced the notion of time complexity last time. We'll quickly revisit that and continue discussion on defining the notion of algorithms which are costlier in terms of execution time and algorithms which are cheaper in terms of execution time. Naturally, our endeavor is to develop and write programs which are as efficient as possible. So this is what we had remarked last time, that while our C++ Dumbo works very fast, it does take a finite amount of time for every computation. And therefore, we must design our programs very carefully such that we do not make Dumbo do any work more than what is absolutely essential. And we had said that the order of magnitude of time required to execute any program is generally called the time complexity of the program or time complexity of the algorithm. So the steps in our program should be so designed that the execution time is minimized. This is the general concept, common sense. We would like to make somebody else uh, do as little work as possible, which is minimally required, whether it is Dumbo or a human being. This was the simple example that we had taken. We had considered estimation of pi using estimate of an area of a square which was drawn on top of two radii. So we said that the area of the circle is pi r square. If we consider a unit disk, it is simply pi. And we said if we discretize this square into some n uh, points, then for i equal to 1 to n on x-axis and for j equal to 1 to n on y-axis, if we figure out how many points lie within this circle, we can get a good estimate of the area of the, uh, uh, the value of pi because that area is obviously pi by 4. So this is what we had written. This was a program to estimate the value of pi. We had done this, read the value of n, which could be 1,000, 10,000, whatever. And we said that this is how we'll estimate pi by finding out whether any point i comma j is within the circle or outside the circle. If the value of i square plus j square was less than n square, we said the point is inside the circle, and therefore we would add 1 to the count. Essentially, in this algorithm, this is the instruction which was to be executed many number of times, because this happens to be inside this iteration for j, which itself is inside this iteration for i. Since each iteration will execute n times, and this is a nested iteration, the total number of executions of this if statement will be n square times. And every time I'm computing one multiplication, another multiplication, third multiplication, one addition, and one comparison. Consequently, the number of computations which are proportional to n square will be very heavy. We had said later on that we could reduce the execution time, first of all, by taking the n square computation out because n was a constant value. Additionally, we said that instead of considering the square, we can consider only a triangle which is half of the square with area pi by 8, and this will reduce computations by half. Coming back to this slide then, we notice that this is where the maximum computations are done. But this time, in the version 3, we said we will not start j equal to 1, but we will start j equal to i. That means we are looking only at the uh, points within the triangle rather than points within the square. This will reduce the complexity significantly. And we calculate the pi by multiplying this count by n2 by 8 rather than 4. This, in general, is a common sense way of reducing computations. However, when you have a very large and complex algorithm, the analysis of the steps of that algorithm to find out how long it will take to execute is sometimes not a very simple matter. It is important, therefore, for us to understand how do we go about it, 
how exactly is the time complexity defined and what kind of care we ought to take while designing our programs. These were some execution results. You will recall that the version 2 was taking something like 36 seconds, whereas this version takes only 17 seconds for 50,000 points. Notice that while every individual computation is done by within few microseconds by Mr. Dumbo, when you make it do many computations, even that would take sizable amount of time which becomes noticeable to you. What is important to understand is that if a program executes in say 500 milliseconds and another program executes in 1200 milliseconds, for us the time taken is just about one second so it does not matter. But one program is still faster than the other. It starts mattering when the execution time becomes many seconds, many minutes, many hours or many days. And that is why it is important for us to understand that every algorithm that you write should be as efficiently written as possible. We had looked at the real time, user time and sys time. This is the same repetition of the last slide. However, the last line has been added. During your labs now when you execute your programs, it will be useful to use the time command. So instead of saying dot slash a dot out, you may say time dot slash a dot out. So that the time command executes that a dot out, giving you the system user and uh, uh, real time. You might want to study the time command details. It has various parameters which you can give as options and you can get the details of different kinds. For that you might want to study the manual for time by saying man time. It would be a useful exercise. So we again look at time complexity of an algorithm. There are actually two ways of looking at it. One is what I call the micro view, the nitty gritty view, details, because as we say, the devil lies in the details. So we want to find out how many arithmetic operations are done, how many comparisons are done, how many assignments are done, how many additions, subtractions, multiplications, etc. That is the micro view going to the nitty gritty. We look at the time taken by each instruction first of all and the number of times that instruction is executed. So addition may take less time than multiplication. So we have to assign some timings to these different instructions and then we have to count how many times an instruction is executed in a program. So while our Dumbo executes instructions in a few tens of microseconds or even in hundreds of nanoseconds, every instruction takes a different amount of time depending upon its nature. That is what is important to understand. It is not that addition, multiplication, comparison, assignment all take the same unit of time. That is not true. Depending upon the complexity of the instruction, Dumbo takes different units of time to execute that instruction. And it is important for us to compare these or count these. So what we do is we simply define an arbitrary unit time. The unit time could be a few microseconds for a fast machine, a few milliseconds for a very slow machine, tens of nanoseconds for a very, very fast machine, but whatever. With respect to that unit, all other relative times can be written down. So it's a good exercise to do that. This is some hypothetical comparative execution times. For example, if you are conducting an assignment, A equal to 5 or A equal to 7, we assume that it takes one unit of time, whatever may be microsecond. If I'm calculating an addition or subtraction, typically it might take two units of time. So please note that if I say A is equal to B plus C, to execute this instruction there are two operations that are happening. B plus C is an addition that will take two units of time. Once the value is calculated, to put it in A will take one unit of time. A total of three units of time would be required. Similarly, multiplication may take three units of time. Division may take five units of time. Comparison inside your if statement. If you say if I less than J, comparison may take three units of time. These are all with respect to integer values. But if you have floating point operations, typically you may multiply by five the times that it takes for doing uh, arithmetic operations on integers. Assignment, however, will take the same amount of time because assignment is taking a value and dumping it into a drawer. It doesn't matter whether it's an integer value or floating point value. But computations, comparisons will take different amount of time. So floating point arithmetic as a thumb rule is costlier than fixed point or integer arithmetic. A special point to note 
when you make an assignment to an array element, if you say A5 equal to something, A5 is well known. Dumbo knows where the drawer for A5 is. But suppose you have an assignment which says A3 into I plus J equal to something. Now that something may be a constant value, but where to put that constant value is not very clear to Dumbo. So Dumbo will have to calculate based on the existing value of I and J this expression. This expression is called index expression. And that index expression will take finite amount of time to calculate. For example, this expression has one multiplication and one addition. So a multiplication, assuming integer values, will take three units of time. Addition will take two units of time. Consequently, this index expression itself will take five units of time. After doing this computation, Dabbo knows the location where to put the final value. So that assignment will take one unit of time. Consequently, A3 star I plus J equal to some constant value also will take 3 plus 2 plus 1, 6 units of time. As I said, ordinarily it doesn't matter because each operation, the unit, would be few microseconds. But we have seen in the program for estimating power that when, when you are doing large amount of computations, these differences start mattering immediately. So how do you proceed in your micro view? What you do is you find out totally how many assignment operations, multiplication operations, division operations, uh, comparison operations, etc. Okay, count these number of units and find out a sum total. However, this can be done in an algorithm which does not have iterations which are executed some n number of times. Because n will be defined as input value. You don't know it in advance. So obviously, such computations of execution time will have to be done in terms of n, which is an external variable. So if there is an iteration which executes n time, where n is an input value, you will agree then that n will largely determine the amount of computations in a program. Because the iterations will be dependent on n. Either you will have nested iteration or simple iteration. And if n is large, the computations done inside the iteration will amount to much more than what is done outside. Simple declarations and assignments, initialization, at the end computing some final value, these all things would be done once only. Whereas what you do within the iteration will be done n times. Consequently, n is termed as the size of the problem. So you have n students, you have n numbers, you have n by n matrix, etc. Et so n is the size of the problem and therefore you try to determine the total number of computational operations carried out by Dumbo in terms of this n. For example, for our pi calculations, we already know that the nested iteration will execute n square times. Within n square times, we are doing some arithmetic comparison, multiplication, whatever, whatever. I have given some arbitrary values here. 24 n square plus 78 n plus 183. These are, let's say, the total number of units of time that this program takes. How do I calculate these? Well, the initialization, such as uh, 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 setting up an iteration, i equal to 1 or i equal to 0, j equal to 0, etc., will take some fixed amount of time. At the end, when I calculate the value of pi by multiplying the area by 8, that will take some amount of computation. I am assuming arbitrarily that that is 183. The outer iteration is executed n times. So whatever happens inside happens n times. If there is something which happens between the outer iteration and external iteration. So this coefficient is again arbitrarily put. It could be 0, it could be 2000, it could be whatever. And what you do inside the inner iteration, which is executed n square times, again I have arbitrarily assumed that you execute instructions amounting to say 24 units of time. These figures are arbitrary, but they can be exactly calculated or counted based on the algorithm that you have. What is important to note is that in general, I will have for such algorithms which have two nested loops based on the size of the problem n, the time complexity will be given by a formula such as a n square plus b n plus c, where a, b and c would be different values depending upon the actual instructions that you execute. Is that okay? There's no confusion so far. Now comes the important point. 
if we want to take a macro view, a larger view. After all, n will vary. But when I compare two algorithms, we can get such expressions for each one and then compare for specific values of n. So consider two hypothetical programs. One is called program 1, the other is called program 2. Let us assume that the time complexity of program 1 is say 24 n square plus 78 n plus 183. Let us assume that the time complexity of program 2 is 12,586 n plus 6,453. Obviously, this program 2, which is solving some different problem of size n, not necessarily the same, or it could be the same problem in a different way, but it obviously has a single iteration. It does not have double iteration. Because if it had double iteration, nested iteration, n square would have cropped in somewhere. But if it has a single iteration, which is run, say, i equal to 0 to n times or 1 to n times, I will have only a factor n here. Now, how do you compare these two expressions? Obviously, the first expression will run faster than the second expression up to a certain value of n because the coefficients are small. Consider, for example, n is 5. If n is 5, n square is 25. 25 into 24 plus 78 into 5 plus 183 is much smaller than 12,586 into 5 plus this. You agree? So in this first algorithm runs faster up to a certain value of n. What happens if that value is crossed? Then the second algorithm will be faster. What is that value? Can you do some arithmetic and find out very quickly? Two minutes. You'll have to do such things in the quiz day after tomorrow, so you might as well do it. Anybody who has found it? 520. Anybody else has found on this side? How much? 5? 521. Ah, we have a, we have a very uh, innovative answer. 521 point, how much? Uh, when we describe the size of a problem, or even if you look at the uh, 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 calculation that we are doing, n is always taken as an integer. So there is no there is no meaning of evaluating expression for a fractional value of n. So what you have to do is you have to say for suppose you get a fraction, 520, 5.6 or whatever, then for values less of n less than that, one algorithm will be faster. For values of n greater than that, another algorithm will be faster. But you are clear on how to compute the time complexity of an algorithm by doing such evaluation. Now here is the point. The point is that for all larger values of n greater than some threshold, whatever, 520, 521, 525, whatever, beyond that, the second algorithm will run faster for every value of n larger than that. That means, for truly large n, the program 2 is more efficient than program 1. Is that understood? For truly large n, program 2 is more efficient than program 1. So we should in general be looking for an algorithm which has which terms? Either constant values or a term involving n. But if there is an algorithm which involves n square, another algorithm which involves n cube, then sometime or the other, no matter what the coefficients are, there will be some value of n beyond which the lower order algorithm will be faster. So this order of the algorithm time complexity, it becomes an important notion when we take the macro view or the larger view of our programs. So the macro view is customary to compare algorithms on the basis of their behavior for very large values of n. Theoretically, the limit as n tends to infinity. So as n tends to infinity, the limit of program 1 will tend to something n square. And limit of program 2 will tend to n. So therefore we say that program 1 is order n square, program 2 is order n. Is that clear? It's that simple. There could be a program which is order n cube. In general, a program of the order polynomial order, a into n raised to p plus b into n raised to p minus 1, etc., etc., is polynomial order. Polynomial order algorithms will take larger and larger depending upon 
the order of the polynomial. Degree 2, degree 3, degree 4 will take larger and larger and larger and much larger by the way. It is not just a linear increase. So consequently, what do we learn from all this analysis? While those who learn computer science theory more will find out variety of ways of figuring out more details about the time complexity and in fact how to design algorithms with known bounds on the time complexity. But for this first course, it is adequate for us to understand the notion of time complexity in the large. That is, as in increases, what should be our endeavor? Our endeavor will be first try to reduce the order of complexity. So whether we are able to count the nitty gritties in how many comparisons, how many multiplications, etc., exactly or not, it does not matter as much as it matters to find out what is the order of our algorithm for a given problem size n. If it is n cube, we should try to reduce it to n square. If it is n square, we should try to reduce to n. If it is n, what can we try to reduce it to? Constant value. So it does not depend on n. There could be something between n and n square. What about n raised to 1.5? There will be something up between n square and n cube, n raised to 2.3. What is between constant value and n? log of n for example, log of n increases far less rapidly than n does. So if I have an algorithm with time complexity of logarithm of n of the order, then it is much better than even an order n algorithm in the long run. So this should be our endeavor. Always remember when you, very briefly in your mind, you should get a hang that whatever program you are writing, what is the order of complexity? Is it order n, order n square, order n cube, less than order n, etc. It's a good good practice to have. Although you may not be able to do much about it, but you should know what algorithm you are writing. And given two comparable algorithms of the same order, say I have two algorithms which are order n or two algorithms which are order n square, then I should pay attention to reduce the coefficients of the expression. So let's go back to the previous slide or previous to previous slide. We had said hypothetically that our algorithm for calculating pi using triangle takes 24 n square plus 78 n plus 183. Clearly the algorithm for calculating those points, uh, counting those points in a square will take twice as many for the n square, right? So that, that algorithm will be taking larger time. So we conclude that in general our effort while writing our program should be A, design the algorithm such that it has minimum order of complexity in terms of the size of the problem n. And B, for a given co same complexity if I have two algorithms, I should try to find one which has smaller values for the coefficients of such an expression that we saw. So this is the bottom line, I would expect all of you to be conscious of this because the computer works very fast we don't bother about the time it takes to execute the program. There is another type of complexity of the algorithm which is called space complexity. How big is your algorithm? Not in terms of the number of instructions that you write, but number of storage locations that you use. So if you use very large amount of storage, it is possible to trade storage for time. There are problems wherein if you have very massive storage, then you keep things stored inside, you don't have to go out and inside the machine to do the computation and you can get time reduced. We shall see subsequently what the space complexity of an algorithm is and how is it related to time complexity, although we will just mention it in passing towards the end of the course. But suffice it to say that right now I would expect each one of you to be consciously looking at your own program and at least making a mental image of what is the order of uh, time complexity of that algorithm. Usually the algorithm that you will write will be polynomial time, order n, order n square, order n cube. But whenever we talk of variation 1, variation 2, variation 3, you will notice that our endeavor has been that even though the order of the algorithm is order n square, we try to reduce the coefficient so that the amount of time taken by that program reduces. We are going to examine this particular notion further by looking at an example of locating an element in an array. 
for our purpose, we have taken these eight sample roll numbers and their marks. You are familiar with this, this is already there on your, uh, on your web. I think I have added one more uh, number because there were only seven in that example. There are eight roll numbers and eight marks. Please remember what we are discussing is in the context of having not eight roll numbers and eight marks, but 800, 8000, 80000. And in fact, we shall later on consider a problem which is so large that we cannot even define an array in computer's memory because computer's memory will fall short. We shall not discuss that problem today, but we shall hint upon what happens and what we need to do when we are executing programs of that large magnitude of data that we have to handle. But currently, the problem here is very simple. These roll numbers and marks have been read into the arrays, roll and marks, and then somebody gives us a roll number. We call it a given roll. Our job is to find out within the arrays if that given roll number exists. For example, given roll is 1006. I may search 1, 2, 3, 4, and whenever I find 1006, I say, yes, found, and I give these marks. But suppose the given roll number is 1007. I may search here, 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 not found. So I will have to report I have not found. This is a simple algorithm, simple common sense, but let us find out in how many different ways we can make this search possible. So here was a program findmarks.cpp. I have written a small variation of that. We had two arrays, roll and marks, and we had n students. We defined a variable called given role, and we define a variable for found marks, we define a variable for position, and we define an iteration index variable i. You will recall that we had written a function to get data for so many roll numbers and marks, and that will get us the value for n students. For the time being, we assume n students is equal to 8. So the array role and array marks is filled up with 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 elements here, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 elements here. Now we read a given roll number and we have to find whether that roll number exists or not. Here is a simple iteration. What I do is I just go through each and every element of the roll number array. If we go back to the previous slide, effectively what it means is we take the given role and go through this, compare it with this, compare it with this, compare it with this, and so on with all the numbers. Let's go back to slide 17 here. So what we are doing is we are setting up an iteration. So I go through this array, zeroth element, first element, second element, up to n minus 1 elements. If the ith element of that role is given role, then I say found marks is equal to marks i. Then I say output marks for given role are these, and I return. There is one problem, however, in this particular way, the way I have written the program, that if the given role does not exist, if I give role number 1945, which does not exist, then what will this program do? It will print marks for 1745, whatever, R. What will it print here? Found marks, it will print some arbitrary value because found marks has never been assigned. Please note that found marks get assigned only if the iteration, while executing the iteration, some, mark, some roll number is found. Otherwise, found marks have no assigned value. So I'll get some arbitrary value. The other problem here is that I keep going through all the elements unnecessarily even after I have found the fellow. So let me correct this step by step, let's say. In the version one, I actually create a new variable called found flag. It's like a green flag, red flag. I start with a red flag whose value is 0. Found flag equal to 0 means I have not found anybody. So this is an arbitrary assumption that I make. In this program, I assume that the arrays have been read. I just declare pause for a position where I find the fellow, if at all I do. I assume that given role, etc., has been declared. I read the given role. And now I set up an iteration. So for i equal to 0 to n, I check if ith roll number is given role. If it is, I set found flag equal to 1. Ah, the green flag is up because I have found him. And I set the position, which is the current position i, to pass. 
So if at all I have found him, when I come out, the found flag would be 1 if I have found him. In which case, if found flag is equal 1, I say found at such and such position because the pos would have been assigned. Yeah. Value of? No, it will not be equal to n because this statement is executed only if this condition is true. <coughs> if roll i is equal to given roll, then and only then I execute these statements. Otherwise, I don't. So obviously the given role will equal to will be equal to some role number only in one case, no other case. So only in the case where it is equal, the pos will be set. In all other cases, this if statement will compare wrongly and this whole thing will not be executed at all. I will simply go to the next state. However, even this program suffers from the fact that I am unnecessarily making comparisons even after locating a fellow. If I don't locate a person throughout these iterations, then this makes sense that I have not found anybody. So I say else not found. However, if I have found somebody, let's say the first roll number itself was given roll number, then I am unnecessarily doing the godagiri of looking at n minus one students because I have already found one. So I will change this now. This is the version two. So here again, I set found flag equal to zero. I read the given role, but now I do it like this, while found flag equal to 0 and i less than n, if role i is equal to given role, found flag is 1, pos is equal to i. Then I set i equal to i plus 1. Notice that when I go back, so I am actually simulating the for loop by actually incrementing i internally and checking if i is less than n. But the main condition of exit is found flag equal to 0, not equal to 0. If it is equal to 0, I keep doing this. Since I start with found flag equal to 0, I go on doing this. There is only one mistake in this program. Has anybody located it? Yes. What is the initial value of i? For the first time when I come in, when I say is roll i equal to given role, what is roll i? Not known. So what should I do? I must be initialized here. Where could I initialize it? I could do that here, for example. So I'll start with i equal to 0. If role 0 is given role, I have found this. Please note, found flag becomes 1. So therefore, I will exit the while loop when i will become actually 1. But that 0 would have been captured in position. Now, this iteration, do you agree, is more efficient than the first iteration? If the first iteration was taking, say, something multiplied by n units of time because it was order n, has the order of this algorithm changed? This is a question. Please read these two algorithms very carefully. The first one. So for the first one, if I were to write the time complexity in terms of, let's say, a n square plus b n plus c, what is the order of this algorithm? Is it order n square? Is this algorithm order n square? No, because the iteration, there is only one iteration here and it executes from 0 to n. So obviously, the number of times any computations, comparisons, etc. are done, there will be a finite multiple of n only. So there is no question of n square. So this algorithm is order n. This algorithm is being executed n times from 0 to n. If I forget the earlier and the later instructions, the behavior of this algorithm is determined by the value of n. And it is a linear order, so order n. But in this order n, how many times is the iteration executed? n times. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, n times. Let us look at the next algorithm. This is a version 2. This algorithm is a while iteration. So it is very difficult to determine how many times in terms of n the algorithm is executed. What is the worst case? Suppose the roll number does not exist at all, then it will be executed n times. What is the best case? When the first roll number itself is this given role, then this loop will be executed exactly once. So best case, you will execute all these instructions inside iteration once. In the worst case, you will execute them n times. On an average, 
How many times will this loop be executed? Ordinarily, you will be searching for a fellow who is within your roll number list, right? If the roll numbers are between, say, 1001 and 1999 for this group, it is highly unlikely that as a teacher I will be searching for a roll number 5720. Although a few roll numbers may be missing, I will generally search within the known range. Consequently, most often I will find that person. So if I am searching for a person who exists in that array, the best case is one search, the worst case is n searches if that person happens to be last. On an average, I will do n by 2 searches. Do you agree then that version 2 is more efficient than version 1? The first version was order n. Second version is also order n, but the coefficient is on an average half. Yeah, you have a question. Yes. This is position of the array in which the roll number is found. Yeah, it will show as 0. That's okay. So what I'm printing is index. Let's say pos position not as we count natural number 1, 2, 3, but we'll say position in the array. Yeah, that's right. But essentially, do you agree that the second algorithm is better than the first one? Because on an average, it will do less computation than the first one. In the worst case, both algorithms will do roughly same amount of computation. Yes? In the worst case, both algorithms will do same amount of computations? OK, my answer is no. Tell me why. My answer is in the worst case, version 2 will carry out more number of computations. Why is that? In the worst case, you agree that both iterations will execute n times. But please note that in the second algorithm, I am checking for found flag equal to 0. I am making an extra comparison. i less than n was being done earlier. i plus i equal to i plus 1 was being done in the for loop. So all those computations are same. But I am doing an extra comparison. So n times I will be doing extra comparisons in the worst case. So in the worst case, second algorithm is marginally costlier than the first algorithm. But on an average, because it will execute n by 2 times, this is much faster. Can we make it better? Given that this is my array, and if I assume that the roll numbers are stored in the array in increasing order of roll numbers, can I do something better? OK, let me put it this way. Uh, have you ever seen printed results of an examination where people who have passed their roll numbers are printed in newspapers? Do you apply the first or second variation where you say given roll number is the first one equal to this, second one equal to this? Do you ever read the complete list published in the newspaper? No. Why? because the roll numbers are arranged in increasing order. So consequently, you naturally go somewhere in between to find out where that given roll number is. And if not, you decide to go either up or down in your search. How do you search a word in dictionary? Suppose you are searching for zebra. Do you start reading A, N, something, something, each word? Is it zebra? Is it zebra? Is it zebra? In fact, when the word starts with Z, you will automatically go towards the end of the dictionary. If the word starts with M, you will go somewhere in between. Consequently, there is a different natural searching mechanism that human mind uses when things are in an ordered fashion. If things are ordered, alphabetically ordered for dictionary, or ordered in increasing uh, order of roll numbers, then the search that you use is a different kind of search. That search is called binary search. This binary search in an array is easily understood if you recall the bisection method that we use for finding out roots of an equation. I will show you the algorithm and we'll discuss the nitty gritties of this algorithm in the next lecture, but I just wanted you to understand the motivation for a better search algorithm. Do you remember the root finding problem that we looked at? We said that if we know a certain value at which the function, let's say, is negative, 
and some other value at which the function is positive, then assuming that there is a root between the two, we will call this low, we will call this high, and we will arbitrarily find the midpoint of this. So mid is nothing but low plus high divided by 2. You agree that this was the logic? And what did we achieve by doing this? We simply reduced the space for search from this entire region, either to this region or to this region. Our normal search that we examined in the two versions of the program amounts to the following. It amounts to saying that I start with low and I keep examining every point on this line, each point, and I try to find out if the value of the function is close to zero at any one of those points. So if I have n points, I am examining the value of the function at each one of those n points. That is what will cause n times the computations. However, if I use this method where I do a bisection of the range and then try to calculate the number of computations I have to do will reduce drastically. This was a real line and therefore there is no notion of actual number of points here. There could be 1000, 5000, 10,000, it entirely depends on me. But imagine now that this entire thing is an array. And I have roll numbers here, 1001, 1002, 1003, etc. And these positions are 0, 1, 2, and so on, up to say 7. If I take this to be the equivalent, then I can actually see a tremendous relationship between the binary search method of finding roots of an equation and searching an array more efficiently where the contents are arranged in increasing order. If the contents are arranged in increasing order, then instead of examining zeroth element, first element, second element, which is equivalent of examining function value at each of these points, I may choose to adopt the strategy of finding out the midpoint. In terms of number of elements of this array, if total elements are 8, then the midpoint is 7 plus 0 by 2. In terms of the index, 0th element is first element, 7th element is the 8th element. So between 0 and 7, what is the midpoint? 7 plus 0 by 2, which is 7 by 2 which is not 3.5 because it's an integer element that I'm looking at. So after truncation, I will get the third element which where I will examine it here. This element. So what I'm doing, I'm suddenly looking at this, this value. Now if the given roll number is larger than this roll, then I have to search on the right hand side. If the given roll number is smaller than this number, I have to search on the left hand side. Consequently, for the subsequent iteration, I will be searching either here or I will be searching here. Just as in the bisection method, I would have searched for the root either in this half or in this half. Effectively, I am reducing the size of the search by 2. And this makes for a very powerful algorithm. Okay, we will continue this discussion, but when the slides are uploaded, I would request you to look at this slide, which gives the algorithm for binary search. I will like you all to read this algorithm and come prepared to understand it, to discuss it better tomorrow. Thank you.